hand over to Liddell and he can uh, get going. Thank you, Thanks, Liddell. So, morning, everybody. Um, on the other end of the phone, we've got Dan Clansnick and Kirk Olson from M6. Uh, Kirk, I think, is actually in um, Sacramento and Dan's in Portland, Oregon. So, it's going to be a, a little bit interesting this morning because we're, we're trying to show you a live presentation of the technology. Uh, utilising the uh, field type functionality at this end and those guys driving the software from that end. So we've had some infrastructure issues with the room which I think we've resolved, um, largely to do with internet and no phones. So, uh, so we're going. So uh, just a little bit of an introduction about Bayo. Who here is actually familiar with the Bayo technology already? So you've seen the, the short ABI type videos available or logged on to one of the presentations we've done? And so just a little bit of background about um, M6 as a company, uh, for those that haven't been familiar with the technology yet. Uh, Max Rosenhoover, the uh, director, CEO slash owner of the, the organisation, started out in the music industry developing uh, uh, sound lab management software and progressed from there to developing other technologies, one of which was a, uh, the that's called the cloud banking service for Wall Street. And then the next project he's taken on has been the development of this application, or suite of applications, which is specifically addressing the holes in the BIM part of our industry. So let's, let's uh, get beyond the use of the design tools and simple collaboration, and let's get into actual BIM for FM, which is what today's session is all about. Okay, so we're all clear that's what we're here for, just to run through that. So I'm going to um, just do get straight into it because I'm conscious of the hairiness of the uh, internet connection here. So I want to do what I can while I know I can do it. And uh, then I'm going to pass over to Dan um, and let Dan maybe... Dan, did you want to introduce yourselves any more than what I've done before we get started? No. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Dan Klansnick. I'm uh, calling in from Portland, Oregon this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear them Hi. okay? That's uh, okay. Feels okay. a little iffy, but we'll survive. All right. So I'm just going to go over to because Dan can't see my screen. I'm just going to go over and uh, get the technology running on my iPad, and we'll do some syncing, and then Dan's going to take over. So just bear with me, Dan. Yeah. So we've just had issues. This Wi-Fi just keeps dropping in and out, guys. So fingers crossed, we can just log straight in. So this is what I'm uh, about to run through is the, the track module from Veo, which is not currently available. It's still in beta, it'll be available in the next couple of months. So I'm just going to, can you see my screen here okay? So I'm just going to select the project. Wait for it to load. So I'm working off my iPad, I'm remote on a, on a site somewhere in the world. I can be working online or offline. I'm going to select the actual building that I want to access. I'm going to select the actual facility that I'm looking for. I'm in the, the documents um, viewer. I select the actual asset that I'm looking at. I've got some imagery and documentation other, and other things here. I can select the, uh, this particular document, get straight to it for that piece of equipment. I can, if I wish, uh, maybe just type in some notes here, uh, replace with uh, PDF, that'll do me. Click done, go back to, save that, just jump back here. Then I might actually uh, get into the, the properties of that object. Maybe I want to change one of the parameters. Maybe it's a an installation date, like I've got here, or um, uh, it could be any other. I could scan some extra information that's on a barcode on the piece of equipment because it's an existing facility, for example. I'll accept that. Save the changes. You notice up here on the right, it's got pending updates. So I can keep going through and making changes and taking photos and scanning information and updating information and just here on the iPad, uh, or maybe I actually want to go to 
find a piece of equipment using the barcode scanner. So I'll just hit the scan button here and uh, select the barcode on the piece of equipment any time now. So it takes me to the parameters for that piece of equipment. And again, maybe I want to change something. Save the changes. And then you see I've got this pending updates button here. So maybe I'm happy now. And I'll hit my updates, I'll submit them. Hit OK a few times. And that's done. Now I can okay, be working. No. Yep. Okay, now what you've just yeah. seen up on the screen here on Dan's screen, I didn't explain this, this is Dan's screen, is this purple border is shown up here. It's just notified this user that there's some updates to the project. So he can hit that. So what I might do right now is just hand over to you, Dan. Sure thing. Can you see my screen with the purple border? Yep. Yep. Okay, great. So uh, what just happened is Liddell committed a change Liddell. from the iPad app. I'm, I'm on the Bayo viewer. I'm using our desktop app. I saw that change. I'm going to accept it. Click update. And Liddell, which, what did you update? I couldn't see your screen. Oh, sorry. Remember? I was updating... Um, some pieces of kit, EFN12 and ES2N. All right, so on my side, I just zoomed into that element. Now, just I'll just explain, we've got about a 20 second lag on this internet connection, so just as he's doing things, bear with us. It's happening instantaneously for him. So, um, so don't let me know when you can see my screen. Yeah, we're zoomed into a um, duct. And yep. you've got a project updates. And on the left side, yep. you see this is all the asset information that was available in the iPad app. And uh, it looks like you changed uh, the install date. Yep. Right. Perfect. So whatever change Liddell made with the iPad app, I saw that in real time on my computer. Um, and I accepted that update. I'm not going to show you this with the latency. I'm logging into Veo with our Excel app. And once this catches up here, I'll be able to just let me know when you get yep. the data. Yeah, so you've selected the office building. So can you see the Excel? Yep. Okay. So this Excel app also reflects the exact same information we saw in the iPad app and in the Veo viewer. I selected the element uh, that was selected in the Excel, and I'm going to scroll over and see that that information that was updated in Excel, I assume that was updated in the iPad, also reflects that update here in Excel. And what I'm doing in Excel is I just changed the quantity of that particular thing from 2 to 25. I committed that change to the server. And now on the Dell computer, you should get an update any second now. You know that? No, I think the Wi-Fi is a bit flaky, mate. OK. Well, on my computer, I have the purple update. Just let me know when you see that. Yep. I'm going to accept that update I just made. And now when I go click on EFN12, I see in my veil here the quantity has just been changed from 2 to 25. I'm going to let this catch up a little bit. Yep. So with Veo, what we built is a platform for model and information aggregation that connects the data throughout the project or building life cycle. And our goal is to give individuals access to the information they need to make a decision when they when they want it and the way they want to see it. I'm going to switch Liddell to uh, 002 overview. If you want to hit that on your screen. Yeah, just bear with me a moment. No problem. Let me know when you're there. My internet 
My Wi-Fi dropped out of the project, so I'm just reconnecting. No problem. And just so everyone knows, uh, AO has an online and offline mode. So um, you can do tons of you can do all the functionality offline, um, use all the features, and then when you're back online, they'll publish those changes to the cloud. So Dan, maybe you just a nod when you're ready. Just while I'm, I'm just reloading the project, sorry. So do you want to just no maybe have a, have a quick chat about the platform itself? In sure, terms can you of... you see my screen yet? Yep, perfect. Oh, okay. So, uh, as I was saying, we built a platform for model and information aggregation that connects the data throughout the building life cycle. And uh, what we do is we, we're all about uh, available the platform for real-time aggregation throughout the building life cycle, and we were all about real access to the latest models and project data. So you just saw that I made a change here in Portland that change propagated throughout the system and an update in FERC in real time. So what that means is when I'm here on my local computer, I save my file and create a local database cache on my computer. That database syncs with the cloud database and in most cases, Amazon Web Services, we can deploy behind your firewall if we need to. Uh, we're completely indifferent about our cloud, your cloud. So when that change syncs to the cloud database, that cloud database syncs with all the other users and all the other devices. And what that means is almost real-time change for all users throughout the project. So, so it's probably important to note here, sorry, Dan, is yeah. A lot of, there's a lot of talk around cloud, obviously, and there's a perception that Veo is a cloud application. Well, it is, but it's also a desktop app application. So don't get lost in the fact that it's it's only a cloud solution. It's not. It's both. It yeah. leverages the power of the cloud, but it's a local install on your desktop or iPad. Sorry, Dan. Yeah, so, so as you were saying, Veo is, what you're looking at is an actual application that's installed on my there's not a website to log in and that lets us work in online or offline uh, also what the screen catches up here uh, with Veo because we're database driven and not file driven that means faster almost real-time model information updates so one of the things that's special about our plumbing and our platform is that when I commit a model to Veo, when I go file and save, and save that model to Veo, that first revision might be really big, but then if I make some small changes to that model, say delete a door, move a window, and then I commit that change to Veo, that change propagates almost instantaneously across the system. So unlike other uh, cloud-based applications that are in the market right now, uh, every trivial change is committed that whole file needs to upload to the cloud and then download back to someone's system. So that means maybe an hour, maybe two hours, to make a change before it propagates to all the users. In Veo, that change is propagated almost instantaneously. So does everyone understand what he's just explained here about model streaming? It's it's just the delta changes that are that are happening incrementally. Yep. So with Veo, you know, we want to take away the pain of collaboration and make it easy to always be working on the current information. So when you're in Veo, no matter what, you know you're always up to date. Let this catch up a little bit. So we're looking so at. Can you see my platform slide? Yep. All right. So Veo is built as a platform with tools. It's a different approach than a traditional point solution software. So with Veo, we've been around, I'd say, six years, and in those six years, we've been doing the hard work of creating uh, the foundation for our platform. So we've been cre creating this way to message and publish between users. Uh, we've been creating the way that uh, models and data automatically sync across users. And what that means is right now we're building uh, the fancy UI and the bells and whistles on top of our platform uh, to give really useful, uh, sort of really useful functionality to users. So 
unlike the other software in the market that has nice uh, bells and whistles right now, but doesn't connect to each other, Bayo connects to each other really well, but we're currently building those bells and whistles. And what we think we're really good at today is this BIM to FM story, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So part of this BIM to FM story is in addition to the different tools we have on our platform that do different things, is we have different ways of interfacing the Bayo project depending on who you are. So if you're a BDC manager or a BIM manager, you may want to use Bayo through what you're looking at now, the Bayo application. But if you're a back office administrator or you're a subcontractor, you may not care that these models exist. You only really care about the data. And in that case, you can access Bayo through the Excel plugin. If you're a facility manager or a field superintendent, again, you may not even care that this 3D model exists. You may only use Bayo through the iPad app. So you can access that data in the mobile app. You can update it. You can sync it with other people. And our ambitions are not to be the silo of all project information, but built into our DNA is the ability to connect to other legacy systems. So we currently have a agreement with New Forma where we connect with their system. We're working on uh, connections with Maximo right now. Um, we're working on ones with Prolog and ProLiance, SharePoint. We have an API uh, where we're making connections with different systems. So our strategy or roadmap is to connect with the legacy tools you use right now and interact with them in a way that, that's really useful. So with BIM to FM, as I was saying, Bayo does a lot of stuff, and we have a lot of tools and different levels of development. But the one tool we think we're really good at, and we, we saw in a very compelling way today, is that we use BIM to FM. So we hear from owners, there's a lot of challenges associated with that. And after construction completes, no one's interested in, in document management. Uh, people are focused on their next project. Uh, the technology for FM and handover is be pretty weak. Um, you know, there's not a lot of things that solve problems for the owner. And when it comes to what we traditionally do, we all understand the flaws. You know, so we collect binders and drawings, you know, maybe models, data source models, put those on DVDs. So we put all that stuff in boxes, we stack those boxes in a shipping crate, and we ship that crate off the seat. And no one ever sees it again. It's just gone forever. So, you know, and there's there's other answers to that. There's ideas of taking out a source model and linking documents to it, but they're all flawed and they don't quite work. You know, they're difficult to update. There's the organizational structure that maybe isn't flexible enough to, to handle these. A lot of times, they're difficult to use. The end users, the facilities managers, aren't interested in learning another sophisticated software. They just want something really easy. Uh, so there's a lot of excitement in the owner world about BIM and BDC. You know, we heard from a survey of owners uh, this spring, you know, that they really want to see uh, easy ways to access the information, the PDFs, the photos, the operations, the maintenance data. Uh, I care about from the field. They want to link that in with asset management software. They want to link that in with the asset condition. And, uh, you know, with Bayo and what we're doing on projects right now, is we think we have a really compelling story about how we organize that project data, those project documents, as built models, in a way that's flexible, easy to access, easy to validate for a bunch of different mechanisms, um, and sort of easy to update throughout the project life cycle. So Dan, could you just go Dan, could you just get back to the slide with the shipping container for me? Please? Yeah, you got it. So I just want to yeah, add yeah. a bit of anecdotal comment for everyone in the room here. So the LAX project, the Tom Bradley terminal redevelopment, the, is everyone familiar with that? Yes and no. It's about a yeah. kilometer of building and 40 gig of geometry. So it's a live project in Bayo and they're using track and, and a bunch of other of the, of the modules. But just interesting on this particular graph here, this is where this came from, was um, they went to the client and, and suggested that we'll look for an extra million dollars, we'll take all of these documents and put them in a digital archive for you and put that in a format that you can 
consume or with, that we can hand over to you post completion. Now, that was an easy tick for the customer to do because it, it would have actually costed over a million dollars to print all the documents. Yeah. Um, all right. So, sorry, I'll, so my little interjection. Sorry, Dan. Yeah, the spec on that job required uh, eight copies on sepia of the as built drawings. That was the only O and M handover requirement. So the construction company negotiated with the owner a better solution, and uh, it turns out another stat is the owner was going to spend two years typing uh, the project asset data into Maximo after project closeout. And the cost of doing that and the delay of doing that more than paid for itself by doing the Bayo handover, where Bayo automatically talks to Maximo and populates the Maximo database, uh, you know, in, in maybe two or three days rather than two or three years. Cool. It's, uh, that was one where there was a lot of reasons uh, for the project team to say yes to Bayo. And that gets me back to this point. And with the Bayo database, you know, we connect with uh, facility management systems and we can connect with them in a variety of different ways, but baked into how we've been uh, designing Bayo is a way to easily connect and transfer data into a variety of schemas uh, and different FM systems. So with that FM handover, Bayo also has the ability to visualize existing current and historical sensor data. And what we do is we install a small hardware appliance that connects to the backnet controllers on a building. That hardware appliance talks to our Bayo server in the cloud and then feeds information to the Bayo desktop app. And that allows us to select pieces of equipment in the model and then chart and graph the sensor data that's coming off those pieces of equipment in real time. So you can look at uh, building performance versus design performance you can look at uh, seasonal trends, building performance, and look at actual data. So to wrap this up, um, this, this part of the presentation, you know, with Bayo, we're trying to not just make small, gradual improvements to the closeout and handover process, but we think uh, we're actually making a paradigm shift that obsoletes this notion of closeout and handover. Uh, it's because all the systems that you collect and validate data are connected in Bayo, so they all speak to each other. Uh, so we have no more silos of information, uh, no more process of managing those silos and then reconfiguring them into a handover, uh, but rather it's just a Bayo data exchange into facilities management that's validated throughout construction, validated in the field, it's modified in uh, and we can do this without any fundamental contractual changes amongst the team. Uh, we, we did that at LAX without any additional process of contractors, without any additional um, uh, workflow or staffing changes. The GC didn't have, have to hire additional staff, they didn't have to hire new people, uh, but it was all done within real project frameworks. And, you know, we think it's, it's a dead simple sell. What you're doing today is flawed. You know, you, you create, you hand over this shipping crate full of drawings and data. It's late, it misses the mark. You may hand over these siloed applications that don't really relate to FM, or we can provide a you know, coherent uh, facilities management closeout deliverable that connects with whatever system you're using for facilities management or can kind of be used as a facilities management system. So with that being said, let me jump into the product. And with this latency, I'm going to go slow and cut the dial to, to play along on his computer. Is this something the dial? Yep. Ready to go. Uh, so just click O3 import models. So the way to get models in the Bayo is through AutoCAD or Revit. And we uh, have plugins that install to those software applications. Uh, we think having plugins and native applications is the way to go because that will help people to keep working in the product they're using. Just click a button or hit a command really quickly and that will publish those changes 
and the Mayo. And because of our, uh, our platform and the way the technology works, those changes are almost propagated or propagated to all users in almost real time. So it's no more one or two hour delays, but it's almost instantaneous updates across the team. Another thing to think of is we're not built on Navisworks or Hoops, and because of that, we built we or because we built our own 3D engine, we can handle the largest files. So, um, as a point of reference, uh, we have a project right now. It's a million square foot replacement hospital, uh, 14 stories, 14, 15 floors, one floor. So the geometry brings Navisworks to to a halt. Grind it to his knees. In Veo, we can open the entire project, navigate smoothly. Uh, LAX was the other project that's mentioned. It's uh, approximately $1.8 billion in new construction. It's a kilometer across. There's hundreds of fabrication files. Um, no other software can open it that I know of. In Veo, we can open the entire project, 45, 50 gigs of just geometry, and navigate very smoothly. And because of our ability to open up any size project and navigate coherently, uh, our processes are no longer tied or restricted to uh, previously accepted uh, compute limitations. So I can coordinate, I can section the building however I want, I can look at risers, I can look at lengths, I can see how different systems interact with each other in ways that just weren't possible in, in old software. So with all, I'm on 06 tags. Yeah, I'm going to wait for the computer to catch up a little bit. And then I'm just going to talk, and then Liddell, when, when you're caught up, if you just want to click through uh, 061, 062, 034, and show the tab, yep. press the tab key to highlight. You got that? Yep. Sweet. So, uh, in Veo, we use tags to organize quickly select groups of individual elements in a variety of ways. So rather than being stuck with the fragile file naming nomenclature from AutoCAD or Revit, uh, we provide a variety of tools to organize the models and data in a way that you want. And we call that tags. So in Veo, I can select tags of things that are levels. I can select tags of things that are all like-minded systems. So one that's mechanical system. I have one that's just plumbing system. And with that, I can quickly, I can combine those tags to make things like, show me all the plumbing that's on level one and take off the hangers or support. So I can toggle those tags, I can combine those tags, and those are a, a fundamental way of organizing the data in, in Bayo in a very useful way. Uh, so, 07 project history. In Bayo, Bayo remembers everything that ever happened. So, because we're that database, we remember who, what, where, when, and why of all the things that have happened throughout the project history. So, that means all the changes that were committed by anyone are recalled, and I can use my project history tool to view the model state at any date. So I can jump back in time and view how the model was last month or last year. Uh, I can I have tools to filter by sign-off dates, milestones. So this whole idea of saving all the individual files, putting them in a folder somewhere that reflect my sign-off date goes away. It's very easy for me to select the date in my project history. I could go inside of Veo, and then Veo will show the model state at that exact point in time and that exact date. So that gives me a lot of tools for tracking issues across time. It gives me a complete audit trail of who did what, when, where, and usually why. And with that, we have tools for analyzing model changes in time. So I can uh, tell Veo that I want to see the changes in the HVAC model between two different dates, and then tell me what's change in that model and which model elements are new. And they will quickly highlight those in the field. And I think it's uh, orange elements in the screen that you're either seeing or see shortly are new elements in the model. And then green are elements that have moved. 
So if you've ever been in a coordination meeting, you know the first 10, 15 minutes can often be uh, what's changed since last coordination meeting. And there we have a tool that quickly just shows you what's changed. So there's no more uh, wasting time trying to figure out what's happened. Another thing, in Veo, colors and materials aren't fixed to geometry universally. Uh, so we always want to see the model in the way that makes the most sense for you. So that means if I'm maybe a bin manager who's in charge of coordination, I'd like to see each discipline in a color, uh, broken down by color. If I'm the owner, maybe I want to see uh, the model colors in a certain way. And depending on who I am and when I log into Veo, they will configure the model elements to, to visually stylize them in the way that I assign to it. So when the computer catches up, you're seeing the HVAC model, the exact same model you were seeing before, but we are seeing it in the way that maybe the HVAC engineer would like to see it. So the supply duct is one color, the return duct is other color, uh, the equipment is red, the clearance zones are transparency, and all the other systems are de-emphasized. It's just being line work. Adele, can you see that? Yep, yeah, we're saying that, and I'm keeping up with you. All right. So another thing we have is we have in band we have this concept called master presets. Master presets are one-click configurations to capture a whole bunch of different settings in band. And we bake that in there because we want to give non-technical users or people who don't want a big sophisticated program, one click settings to uh, quickly configure everything about Bale in the way they want to see it. So it can change the camera, it can change the UI, it can change the section boxes, it can change the visual style of the way we see the model. There's all sorts of power there burns into the, the one click setting. I want to talk a little bit about Pulse. I'm going to maximize my screen to help you see this. And Pulse is our app for visualizing real-time sensor data. And for the sake of our uh, existing compute limitations, I'm just going to show some screenshots instead of live data. And I'm going to wait for this to catch up with what Pulse yep. does is Pulse is up. You got it? Yep. Okay. So Pulse lets us assign um, sensor data, like a uh, reads of sensor data to model elements and then graph those, visualize those however we want. So any element within the building that we can get back that sensor data from, we can create charts and graphs to compare that data historically, see how it compares to other things. We can put flags in Bayo to see if elements are operating outside of normal conditions. So I could set up, these are my normal, I could, for instance, I could set up, uh, these are my normal operating conditions for these particular fan coil units. If they exceed the threshold of those normal operating conditions, they will fire up a warning. It can zoom to that fan coil unit. It can show you related documents about that fan coil unit and just provide helpful context information about what's going on. So Dan, if I could jump in here as well. So it's a bit hard with yep. Pulse because to show Pulse properly, you need it on an actual project and you need client permission, obviously, to access live sensor feed data. So that's, hence we're yeah. showing some pre-configured stuff here. Um, so for example, with Pulse, uh, does everyone understand what BACnet protocol is? No? no. It, it's an industry standard protocol, communication protocol for sensors. So uh, there's other protocols, but that's the most common, and it's very easy to connect in the back end. So you can have an IP address for something. Uh, if you think of card app controllers or um, security swipes for uh, staff walking through a building, the Pulse will allow us to actually, um, just bear with me, oh, get that clear. Pulse will allow us to track people movement through a facility. Uh, you could, if you want to, if you've got an IP address or a, a digital representation in the model of a security camera or something, you can click on the camera in the model and see the live feed from that camera. That's a pretty neat one. So you can actually have 
based on the sensors going off, an alarm going, being triggered or something, you could actually have the security person, if they've got access to the model, see a visual representation and the live feed. Or you could have an email notification or an SMS alert, that sort of stuff to come out. So we've really blurred the lines between digital and reality here. And Pulse is an extremely powerful application. Sorry, I'll let you keep going uh, there. No, I just want to add that Pulse can be extremely powerful, especially when we get creative about it. So we can uh, track, use RFID tags to track data, say, of equipment as it's being installed, or um, if you're working on a heavy civil or industrial project, if you're trying to coordinate you know, a 400 truck concrete pour, and we can use RFID tags on those concrete trucks to track where they are in time, staging on your site to, to best communicate and coordinate that pour in real time. Um, we can put uh, RFID tags on hard hats of employees, so when they uh, scan into a project site that's updated, you see in real time where those employees are. And uh, as we connect that data to the platform, you can start to do really sophisticated analysis about scheduling and efficiency of crews. Um, you know, and can, can I just backtrack to your comment about the concrete? Have we got any builders in the room? Yeah. No? So I, I know that uh, builders are, are very keen on not only tracking the concrete pour, but the ability to track the truck or the depot that it came from and for the guys on site to actually be able to track that data as it comes in because they don't want to just have someone with the punch list ticking off that yes we've accepted this bore and yes it's met the conditions. They actually want to trap the conditions and the metadata around that. This allows us to do that right to the whatever level we need to. And you've got that yeah, versioned yeah. model stream all the way through. Sorry Dan. Yeah, I was just listening. I think that's great. And, um, you know, we could track the, the conditions that affect the, the concrete pour and what additives are being used and all the metadata. As you said, so it's, it's the limitations are really uh, the creativity of how people want to combine these tools and really express them in a powerful way. So, uh, to, to move on a little bit, what I, what I'm Fundamentally in Bayo, part of our BIM to FM handover is this idea of associating documents to elements in the model. And we want to give tool, uh, tools for people to organize with model elements in really uh, you know, coherent and powerful ways. So at a fundamental level, I can click on an element in Bayo and I can see all the documents that are associated to it. So once the uh, latency catches up, if I click here on this piece of electrical equipment, I can toggle through, I'm clicking on 11.1 half the transformer without, I can toggle through some of these PDFs that are operational maintenance manual, that are photos of that particular element. And once this catches up, I just selected, I can select a room or a floor plan. And then I can see the drawings, the as built drawings associated with that room or floor plan. So it could be, uh, Here's my architecture plan, here's my mechanical plan, here's my as-built drawings. It could be photos that I see from the site. So with them, I'm just looking through the alarms. Yeah, there's a little bit of lag on, on the document yeah. viewer. So I'm just, it catches up. So 11.4, the chiller photo master preset. Yep. Uh, here's a photo that was contributed from the field. At LAX, also taking photos of all the blocker uh, the equipment placards and associating those to the assets within the model. So I can quickly find a piece of equipment I care about. I can see a photo of that equipment installed and I can see a photo of uh, the placard that details the information about that particular piece of equipment. And with some of the information, I can also track those object properties inside of Mayo. So once it catches up here, the parameters that I care about for my assets are totally flexible, really customizable, and then all the values can be updated in Veo. So right now I have uh, looks like an electrical panel selected. I can change the quantity of that electrical panel from five to fifty, and 
And once that catches up here, I'll just let you guys see that. So, Liddell, if you just want to tell me when you can see my screen. Yeah, we can see it. All right. So, in Mayo, I can change, update any of this information any way I want. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to save that change. And in a couple seconds here, depending on how uh, sturdy your internet connection is, Liddell is going to get a purple border around his screen that's going to show that update. It's going to change the quantity from 50 or from 5 to 50. Yeah, I, if it comes up, I'll tell you. I, I've got really flaky Wi Fi here, Dan. No problem. Just let me know when you can see Excel on my computer. Can see Excel. All right. And as we were saying in the introduction, the same information that's available that's at the Bayo viewer is available inside of Excel plugin. So if I go find that asset I was tracking, which is under uh, 3C and which is this one right here, in Excel. And you'll see from Excel to the Veo viewer, this number does the same. The quantity is 50. And you're not going to be able to see this with the latency, but if I click on a cell in Excel, Veo will automatically zoom to that element. So these two worlds are connected. So what I see is not a spreadsheet I'm looking at in Excel, but it's actually a uh, visualization of the data table, the record table in the database. So that's how we can connect these two worlds. And moreover, if I make a change in Excel, I say, you know, that thing's not really 50. I really only have one. Uh, let's just say I, I really have 75 of those things. Uh, in Excel, that field will turn up as yellow. I can commit that save to the server. And then my video viewer almost instantaneously has a yellow or uh, purple border. Can you see that, Liddell? Yeah, the purple border is not showing up. Okay, let me know when it shows up. It's up now. Yep. All right. And then once I have that purple border, I can accept that change. And all three worlds will update. So what is just... This is gonna so what, what Dan's just run through is, uh, let's just re-clarify this, we've got someone working inside the VAO project updating data tables, we've got someone else maybe viewing the model somewhere else, we've got another person logged into an Excel app and updating tables and parameters, and it's all syncing together seamlessly. Okay, that's, that's pretty earth shattering compared to current processes, yeah? Yeah. And if you look at my iPad app, I don't know if you can see this though, but I'm about to scan a barcode. And what that does is that gives me the documents that are tied to that asset. Yep. And once this links, you can see the properties of that asset. And I'm going to wait for this to catch up. Yeah, we're looking at a PDF and some properties. Yep. Okay. Just give, let me know when you can see the object properties. Yep. And then that's all coordinated in real time, so I can again change that quantity to 100. And I can say, you know, that guy in the Excel sheet, he doesn't know what he's doing. It's really 100. I can commit those changes to the system, and now all three worlds are updated. You can see in Excel, that sheet now says 100. I'm going to wait a couple seconds for that to catch up. And then the Veo viewer, when I accept that update, will all say 100. So, just to wrap up, the, the power of what we're doing here is that in our platform, all these different worlds are connected in real time. And uh, Liddell, you, I think I'm going to hand it over to you to, to try and explain this a little bit better live. Does that sound good? 
If you like, what are you talking about? Sorry, Dan, what would you like me to cover? Oh, oh, I just wanted to, I guess I would just wrap things up okay. with, with the point that all, all these worlds are connected. And if you wanted to do uh, another expression of that or another demo of that with your yep. you know, real life data live where people could see it, that'd be perfect. Or if you just want to uh, take any questions or, or, or feel that, so, that'd be fine too. So, so thank you. Okay, so thanks, Dan. So. I've got Veo on my computer here, so if you want to have a look after the session, that's fine. But while we've got Dan on the line, is there any questions? I mean, we've sort of flown through at a high level through Veo and the different modules. We haven't talked about a couple of the modules, but because uh, today's focus is really about the BIM to FM piece. Uh, has there anyone got some questions for, I mean, Dan's, uh, it's a, the M6 team's a very tight team. There's about 20 development staff, uh, very creative staff very um, much focused on quick response times to customers, which is a unique thing in this industry. So these guys will provide uh, technical support and rectification or bug fix or uh, you know, enhanced functionality extremely quickly because their owners <coughs> is making the technology work for the customer. So that's pretty refreshing in this world, right? Everyone's nodding, Dan. <laughs> um, that's great. So, um, Dan and the, Dan's a pretty key part of the team over there, and there's you know hourly, daily, weekly meetings around um, making sure that particular aspects of development are on track. Uh, we get direct input in with the guys as well in terms of even things like UI improvements, that sort of stuff. So, because it is, I mean, but the technology is not new; it's six years old been going for six years and this is a pretty important thing to understand and Dan touched on before we talked about the plumbing versus the bells and whistles. That's really a core tenet I guess of, of how the M6 team work is rather than worry about the bells and whistles and then try and re-architect the back end which is difficult, they've spent their time, six years, working on getting the plumbing right, the 3D engine right, the connectivity right so that the bells and whistles can really be whatever you want them to be. Now, I, I had the good fortune of spending a week with the guys last week over in Portland, and um, there was quite a number of times where myself and Chad, um, the technical specialist that was with me, when we were talking to Dan and, and his colleagues about, it would be nice if we could do this, or wouldn't it be awesome if you could do that? And it was never, ever, oh, gee, I wonder how you program that. It was always, yeah, we could do that. It's just a matter of prioritisation. It didn't matter what sort of weird thing we, we threw at them was, yeah, we could do that. So th this is a very different team to what I've ever been accustomed to dealing with at a development level. Um, but getting back to the technology, sorry. Um, yes, we can do coordination, that's its core. So we can, we can load up AutoCAD models, Revit models, all three. Uh, we're just doing some testing around Civil 3D, Map 3D for the infrastructure guys. Mm -hmm. um, we will soon have native uh, ARCHICAD import. So the Nemchek guys are working on the importers there. And we will soon have um, the I model from Bentley importers. Yep. So we, uh, now the interesting part is similar to Navis, the, the, the VAO platform will coordinate the models <coughs> together. What about the IFC, well not IFC, I mean the, the shop detailing side of it, when you're starting to go into the FM, the as bills, that kind of thing, what platform or format are you, are you looking at as a generalised IFC format? <coughs> no, um, I might let Dan answer the IFC question as to why it's not most appropriate. Yeah. Um, but in terms of joinery and shop details, I mean, we can use AutoCAD or we can use Revit. Yeah. What, which tool do you what use? What is the shop detailers don't use that? How are we getting that information there? You know, what are they using? I'm, I'm, you know, no, the so Tecla or something like that. Yeah. So at the moment, yeah. sorry, I, I was going to answer that, but if you can add to what I say, Dan. So at the moment, DWG we can, we can get. So if those guys can provide a, a DWG, mm -hmm. we can bring that in. Mm -hmm. So that it's probably a two-step at the moment. Did you want to add anything yeah. to that around maybe the IFC side, Dan? 
Sure, I didn't, I didn't pick up the whole question, but... Um, uh, talking about shop that. fitting and uh, the, the, sorry, the, the joinery details type stuff, but the question was, the, the comment about IFC is probably what I wanted you to respond to. Oh, sure. Um, when it comes to supporting IFC, that's something that's on our roadmap, but it, as Liddell said, it's just a function of priority. And our current thinking is such that uh, civil 3D is a priority, family eye models priority. After that, it's probably TECLA, SCS2, and then into IFC. Oh, and I, I also want to mention we do support some other file formats like uh, stereo, STL, like uh, FBX, uh, a few other one offs. But for the most part, it's anything you can open inside of Revit or AutoCAD in the bay. So object enablers, uh, Springcad, HydroCAD, MEP plus, plus objects, all that gets into Veo fine. It's been, it's been a very long time since we haven't been able to get a file into Veo. And when that happens, uh, it's actually kind of great because then, then we support it as quick as we can and that's one more file uh, format we support. So just probably the comment about IFC was, um, yeah. When people started asking for it, the M6 preference was to have the native data, not through a translated yeah. Yeah. protocol. So that it, it took a little bit of discussion with the Nemechek guys, but um, they saw the value of actually creating those exporters from um, Vectorworks, Archicad, etc., yeah. Skia, so that they, we can actually use work with the raw data, not IC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of technical <coughs> benefits to working that route for us. Any other questions at all? Thoughts, comments, questions? Yeah, for us, we'll just take a classification system, um, you know, classification of the data uh, in terms of its function, uh, categorization. Yep, so, so I'll just, because Dan wouldn't have heard you. So the question was about classification of data and categorization. Yeah. Of data, I think I'll let you answer that probably around tags and master presets. Yeah, so in May we have a, a variety of mechanisms to organize the, the model elements and data, and mostly that's grouped under this notion we call tags. And tags can be like Revit parameters, so it can be any data that comes with Revit as a parameter. Uh, we can generate tags from, we have tools for selecting which parameters we want to be tagged and which ones we don't. Uh, the same holds true with AutoCAD. For example, AutoCAD layers become tags. Um, then we have lots of other mechanisms for creating tags, either through the Excel spreadsheet or through uh, the project structure itself. So it could be like all elements that are of this file, it's a tag of plumbing. And uh, when all those other tag systems are exhausted, you can do something very simply like clicking on a model element and then making it a tag. So just this very manual approach of selecting something and giving it some, some properties. Um, and then with the tags, we can also combine them in, in very powerful ways, what we call dynamic tags. So that would be logical operators of union and disjunction of those tags. So I can say, Show me all things that are HVAC minus the, the hanger ducts or minus seismic. And then if you're uh, extremely uh, uh, technically savvy, you can actually use SQL queries to create very sophisticated uh, models for serving up the data. So you could say, show me all things that were are purple that are next to column line to that were imported on a Tuesday. And then they would give you that result. So depending on who you are and your level of sophistication, uh, there's, there's lots of mechanisms for organizing and visualizing the data. Can I answer your question? Yeah, I, I just, uh, I mean, I've, I've, uh, the, the question might be two parts. The second one is, is there, do you apply a consistent approach to that? Um, you know, I, I can understand that if you're taking the whole data, you can any classification system you want, um, but presumably somebody's put it in in the first place. Yep. Um, they hopefully are following a classification system. Yeah. And then it gets to, to Veo, 
Um, so I think that that question probably comes back more to the project you're working on and the let's go. I don't want to use the execution plan, but the yeah. the agreement in place for how you're going to structure yeah, your data. Yeah. So I think that would affect that. And then is that standard? Absolutely. You just so use this that is an open team. architecture kind of approach. You just it is what it is. Yep. Yep. So you can apply whatever standard you like. So if you've got a suite of university projects and yep. you want to follow you know, for, for your campus. Same type you of tags, etc. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Any other there were some other questions here earlier? A few other hands went up. Yep. You're right. I was just wondering how um, how if you're working on the original model and you're importing it, whether you can actually push the data back the other way again, how easy it is to do that. No, you're not. Did you hear the question, Dan? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a little tricky for us. We have the infrastructure in place to publish information back into Revit. So you can make a change in Bay on a particular asset and then update that Revit file automatically. However, uh, we have that turned off right now. And uh, that's because when we investigate the workflow around that process, uh, we usually find that, or we've always found so far that, that we'd rather keep it off, we'd rather turn that plumbing off to allow people to publish back into to Revit. But I'll tell you, if we find out people really want it, and uh, there's real life uh, examples where that makes sense and that's valuable, it's uh, almost trivial for us to, to allow that functionality back in the mail. Would you rather only on that? Question would be more geometry rather than in big data associated, you know, that sort of thing. So yeah. that pushback in yeah, So the pushback in, do you want that main? Is, is that primarily geometry or data as well, Dan? Uh, data. Yeah. Well, well, ideally, when you cannot create geometry, you, we, we can only update the, the data in Veil. Okay. So I think we're getting the wrap up over. Yeah, we are. Just quickly, the morning tea is being served and the room is being used for the next session in okay. about 15 minutes. So um, the Dell's going to be around for the next couple of days. Yeah. Um, so if you want any other questions answered, please hunt them down. I'm pretty sure we will have to answer them. So, um, that's that we've been the, given the official boot out of the room, Dan. So, um, so I'd, I'd, I'd just like to say thanks very much, Dan, for struggling through all these internet issues and setup issues this morning. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Yep. Um, Thanks everyone for participating. We'll be down at our booth on and off. If you just track me down, if you want to sit and have a, a closer look, or if we need to organise a more detailed presentation for anyone, yep. uh, I will cover one thing. But while everyone's here, the pricing uh, is very different to what you're accustomed to in the uh, traditional vendor world. So it's single user pricing of three thousand dollars a year for a single user license, twenty five gig of storage, unlimited projects. Or if it's a project, then it's a monthly fee for the project. Okay? Cool. With unlimited users and pretty much unlimited data, really. Um, mm -hmm. So, a very different model to traditional approaches for both the collaboration end and the design tool end. All right, so thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Mike.